I can't remember who suggested to cover this, but all I can say is you don't get a birthday this year. Ah, just kidding. Ah, uh, well, maybe not. I mean, the complexities of this movie do run a little deeper than we would have first imagined, but in the not so distant present, a couple would fall on hard times because the guy is an absolute loser and the girl literally just wants to be an astrobiologist, which is unfathomably based science work. Don't worry, I'll complain more about him in depth later, but they would go to the beach to have a good time and reconnect after he ended up sending her cryptic emails about getting back together. Also, this dude's haircut sucks. As they go there to spend some quality time, they realize the entire neighborhood is completely abandoned, or so it would seem. Heading inside, it's not too much longer before they find out another couple, friends of Randall's father, appear to already have been there and been there for a while, and they're acting kind of strangely. It would then turn out, they may have just been strange people, because as time goes on, they begin to realize the entire area around them is infested with something that they think is beautiful. But as a microbiologist myself, this would be highly alarming. Like, get in the car and leave immediately alarming, because something is clearly not right. And this does turn out to be the case. So what exactly is the bioluminescent wonder land, which is bad, that has surrounded the house and area? What does it mean for human biochemistry? And what does it mean for survival of our species? Well, let's discuss that in today's episode over the beach house. But first, this episode is sponsored by Rocket Money. So things are going rather interesting in this time frame, considering everything is pretty much ungodly expensive. If you're trying to improve your financial health and achieve your goals by canceling unwanted subscriptions, lowering bills, and setting up budgets as well as monitoring credit and providing a holistic view of your finances, then I've got good news for you. This one-stop shop platform can help you achieve those goals by getting your finances under control. I bet you're a lot like me. It was Christmas in 2018 and you wanted to watch Polar Express for the hundredth time, so you signed up for Apple TV only to forget it for six years. At $4.99 a month, that comes out to $359.28, all because I forgot about a subscription that I didn't notice coming out of my account over time. That money lost is something I could have invested or in general, I could have grown my net worth with it rather than just having it quietly exit my account. By using the feature of canceling unwanted subscriptions, it means in the future, I won't be doing that again. Not to mention with its ability to set up budgets and automatically track your spending category, you can stay within the parameters that you set for yourself, utilizing this tool to seek financial freedom. So if that sounds good for you, you can download Rocket Money and unlock more features with premium. Go to rocketmoney.com forward slash Roanoke Gaming or click the link in the video description. All right, let's get back to it. So before kicking it off, after a week break on Roanoke Tales, I have returned. Last week we talked about the vanishing of the USS Cyclops in the Bermuda Triangle, as well as my great aunt and uncle uh, going missing in the Bermuda Triangle. So some Roanoke lore. If you want to watch that, I'm looking for some feedback on that episode, so go check it out. I'll link it after this. But we kick off our story to me thinking my speakers were broken on my TV, because no matter how loud I turned it up, I was not getting any noise. We then descend into the ocean. I think we can all appreciate how dangerous that is given the immense pressures a craft is under while going that deep. But as we approach a hydrothermal vent, it is just sitting there hydrothermaling menacingly. So with that setup done, we now head to the beach. I have no idea where this will be located. It looks like maybe the Northeast, maybe? Ha! I was right, it was filmed in Massachusetts. As a couple then approaches in a car, you should probably have traded it in by now, but don't get it twisted though. A, Toyota Supremacy. Two, these cars will never die. And D, they're pretty fuel efficient getting 31 miles per gallon on the highway with a four banger 2.2 liter engine. But you probably should have traded it time-wise because for any other reason, I mean, the car is pretty much a ride or die. And also the absolute irony of riding this yesterday because my wife ended up getting her car rear-ended by a literal Toyota Camry, same year, same color as this movie. And the thing still drove off with like a caved in front hood and destroyed grill. You really cannot kill these things. All right, I'm getting really sidetracked. So as they pull up, listening to some god awful music and sitting in silence. Oh man, I've been there. After a car trip with an ex before, everyone should experience that at least once in their life. So it's not looking like spring break 2020 is going to be that great. Then again, I don't think that was really a great spring break for a lot of people, except for that one chick they interviewed on TV during spring break who sounded like her throat was destroyed. But hopefully, well, not hopefully, but probably from COVID. That was just bad phrasing, so as they head inside, they share a kiss as Emily says that she missed Randall. Walking in, Randall's like, uh, yeah, so what do you want to do? Because clearly he wants something. So, I've broken away a lot, but Papa Rono can vice time. Any woman that looks at you like that, or really any partner who has that type of body language, I'm gonna go ahead and tell you they aren't into it. Cool your jets for a few minutes if you read that on them. Y'all can attempt to reconnect later, but right now ain't the time, because this was a painful watch. So after what I can only imagine was a completely unenthusiastic jaunt, the guy then starts to fall asleep as Emily just sort of sits there. You'll see Randall sleeping moves the plot forward. It's a cinematic device to keep the ball rolling, so to speak. I'm like 80% sure this guy has chronic fatigue syndrome or something. 
So Emily at this point gets up as Randall says the most Amy thing possible, which I'm happy to add in a new name for the counterpart to the world's worst person, Mail Edition. Congratulations, Randall. Your Amy awaits. Again, Emily just got her organic chemistry degree, right? So you want to know how bad organic chemistry kicked me in the crotch? You have to be highly intelligent or at least have like a natural knack for it. I like seriously have never struggled with a course before and this thing, good lord, they called it a weeder course at my school and if you wanted your bio degree, you had to go through it and it was tough. It's not for everyone, but I mean I was studying like two to three times the normal amount that I had to for like any other class. So anyhow. Old Randy Savage over here dropped out of college. That's not a problem, as it's not for everyone, but Emily wants to go get her master's. And this dude's like, isn't your grad school, like, gonna take years? Can't that wait? You know it's bullcrap, right? You know that. Like, okay, flock of seagulls, haircut, and a rainstorm. Let's calm down. If we wanted a masterful opinion on education and what is or isn't important, we probably wouldn't go ask the guy who wants to live at a beach house year-round on his parents' dime, who's trying to just, like, figure himself out, man. Like, bro, get out of here with that. So after Cringe Factory gets done running his Phalus holster about how they could just vacation all the time, a real winner, she leaves the room and then heads to the bathroom. I know I'm letting the intrusive thoughts about Randall win during this video, but sometimes a movie just absolutely gets me. So we get this weird moment where she runs her hands in the water before finding pills. Like, a lot of pills. As she heads downstairs, this place looks mega lived in. Like, just that morning lived in. In fact, as she turns around, a woman enters the house. Going upstairs, she rouses Randall, who gets up and heads downstairs. As they go around the corner, Mrs. Turner mentions how Doc invited them over there. So now we meet Mitch Turner. It's Officer Doofy from Scary Movie 1, I'm pretty sure. I that's Luke Wilson. No, actually, this guy's Jake Weber. Weird how similar they look. So they all decide to eat dinner together as Emily goes and gets the bags, but really she just goes outside to have a cigarette, and as she does, she spots something on the ground as Randall comes outside. So now we get some backstory on how big of a loser Randall is. Again, he's not a loser because he left school, but he did leave school. Ditched the girl, started sending her cryptic emails rather than just calling her. Who sends cryptic emails? Losers. And then all of a sudden he wants to get back together. Oh, and he didn't even clear it with this old man about coming to the beach house, he just showed up. There's a word for this, and I'll let you use your imagination on what that is. And this is a really opinionated episode, I probably have already lost a lot of people. Hopefully y'all still enjoy it. So we're getting into the science here momentarily, we're just getting everything set up and letting me complain. So later that night, as they all sit down to have dinner, Randall eats one of the oysters as Emily talks about her major and how she wants to do astrobiology. Now. This is the point that's actually rather important. Remember that thing outside that Emily was looking at when she was having a cigarette? That's foreshadowing. Anyhow, back to the astrobiology. It has more to do with life on this planet, basically how life can leave in extreme environments. We call them extremophiles, and specifically what she would be studying and how all the right conditions had to come together to be the catalyst for life on this planet. They ask what Randall is studying in college, and he kind of talks about how he's just going to backpack through your... I'm, I'm making that up. He basically said he was just going to hang out and find himself. I, I don't know. I stopped listening to this guy and really sort of the rest of the table. So as he wants to figure himself out, but he wants to do so by not getting a job or supporting himself, that would be crazy. No, he wants to find himself by just sort of hanging out. Look, man, I get it. If you want to, like, figure out what you want to do in your life and you want to, like, figure out your direction, what you're actually interested, I totally 100% think you should do that, whether that be school, the trades, whatever you want to do. But you need to get a job during that time frame. So anyways, what are extremophiles exactly? Earth's history has actually not been too kind to life, believe it or not. Currently, we are existing in a period of time that is, despite sociological strife, uh, physically the planet is pretty calm. This has allowed life to flourish and spread across the entire globe. Extremophiles may have been the earliest form of life that we know of given the environment that they live in. So deep under the ocean, the water is pitch black and the temperatures are extremely low. Food is scarce and energy in the environment overall is basically null. This has tested life and pushed it to the extremes, basically creating a perfect environment of only the strongest of the strongest of the strongest survive, hence the extremophile moniker. This life will cluster around hydrothermal vents where the environment is heated by the waters that exit the vents at over 750 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about 400 degrees Celsius. This is well past boiling, and if anything accidentally goes directly into the vent, it's going to be cooked. Now, one of the things that is highly interesting about this type of hydrothermal vent is that we believe Europa and Callisto, which are moons that orbit Jupiter, may actually have these hydrothermal vents, and the surface of the planet is essentially just frozen ice, which means there could be liquid water underneath that ice, and potentially with that, if hydrothermal vents actually do kind of kickstart life, it's possible there could be life out there. But when it comes to these vents, what they put out is very important. Hydrogen sulfide, hydrogen gases, ammonia, chemicals that appear at some point possibly to have undergone chemical reactions that may have formed some of the first molecules. Now something to understand before moving on is life is hypothesized to have potentially started at the vents. 
and that is a huge qualifier potentially because as I will go on to say later we truly do not know where life came from on this planet but these vents are still inhabited today with life cropping up on them sometimes very old and ancient looking life that is completely reliant on these vents life as we know it is actually reliant on the Sun and photosynthesis at least up here both plants and animals do need the Sun but life in the deep sea is known to undergo chemosynthesis to obtain their nutrition which essentially means they are completely independent of sunlight and instead will use chemicals put out by the vents to survive but this could be potentially a solution for the issues presented later as to what we would do in a situation like this as a species to overcome the threat posed by this outbreak so as Randall gets up to get more wine, they are running out, and then Randall mentions he has something else. The devil's lettuce, except in edible form. Emily objects, saying that, well, they're kind of medicated, so maybe we shouldn't do that, but they all decide to throw on some music and say, screw it. Emily begins talking to Mrs. Turner about how her goal for her masters is astrobiology. As she does, Mitch starts uh, kind of having a zone out moment over there. But now the question could be raised, is it the lettuce or something else? Emily goes on about how the elements are there, but something basically had to happen for nucleic acid to form. It didn't just spontaneously generate. The leap does not seem possible to just appear out of the ether with chemical reactions only, mainly because we do not just randomly see it happening now either. Granted, humans have only been observing the vents sporadically for the last few decades or so, so it's not like we have a sample size that large to really say yay or nay. But see, that's what's interesting about life on this planet. Despite some people being very sure for some reason with virtually no information, uh, we, we don't really know where life came from. We have ideas. Everyone has ideas on where it came from, but how it started, where that initial catalyst was, we can't point to it. Obviously, there are two theories on that, and the first would be creation. And this is the more religious route, but basically the generalized thinking is that all life was created by God. God was the catalyst that provided our planet with the leap from chemical reactions conducting themselves for perhaps billions of years to where we are now. You can go even further past that and kind of do another subdivision of did God form life as we know it at this point in time with all animals taking the form they do now and then man being like what we are now or did God start life and let it naturally progress from there. The latter would seem to suggest that religion and the theory of evolution are not mutually exclusive to one another. The other theory is that life began near just hydrothermal vents which was spewing out tons of organic chemicals and over time that formed chains such as amino acids. Through lightning strikes brought on by the atmosphere striking the ocean, which was essentially a primordial soup at this point in time, this led to eventually the right amino acid chain to be hit, forming nucleic acid, which then led to other chemicals being acquired, which led to a very ancient form of life, such as prokaryotes and archaea. But it really comes down at this point in time to what do you believe? Because despite progress being made in attempting to determine this, we still don't know what happened. You can almost liken it to, let me ask you a question. What happened during the billions of years before you were born. Would you even know about the last 100 years before you were born if nobody told you anything? That's basically our species feeling around in the dark for information right now. And I always like to look back at a quote, however, concerning information like this. As Werner Heisenberg stated, you know, the guy who formulated quantum mechanics in terms of matrices, everybody always attributes the wrong quote to him about, the, I've done it myself, the, the first sip of the glass of science breeds atheism. That's not what he actually said, apparently. He actually said, although I am now convinced that scientific truth is unassailable in its own field, I have never found it possible to dismiss the content of religious thinking as simply part of an outmoded phase in the consciousness of mankind. A part we shall have to give up from now on. Basically, the idea is centered around science is true, but religion also appears to be true as well. The two are not mutually exclusive. You do well to remember that, but at the end of the day, it's your choice what you believe at this point course so do what you want philosophical conjecture aside as emily talks mitch starts talking about soft water for some reason emily sits there for a minute continuing as randall then lies down see he only sleeps all of them begin sort of like phasing out of consciousness at this point and emily then suddenly wakes up and nobody is in the room that's a little odd apparently they all went outside without her and as they look around they see something that is highly disturbing you see this blue coloring on all the plants and trees and the ground and the literal wind that's really bad <laughs> let me put it this way it's not a normal event which means bacteria or algae that is usually in the ocean has now become airborne which means if that same bacteria or algal bloom that we normally see in the oceans is now getting into your lungs then best case scenario you just get sick because spontaneously developing this ability seems unlikely which points that this is another organism entirely and something completely new which means we have no idea how it would interact with our meat suits now the thing to understand about the bacteria and algae in the ocean and of this particular strain which i'm leaning more towards algae i believe is that it's not all dancing in the bioluminescence singing about the joys of how beautiful it is 
This crap is actually a nightmare. The bacteria that is commonly found lighting up beaches as well as algae in the waters, after being agitated, it's typically poisonous to fish. They are known as uh, dinoflagellates and they can be quite dangerous and result in mass die-outs of fish in the area. Now with humans, we have this wonderful thing called skin, which provides uh, pretty much an air and water type barrier from the outside world. And because we breathe air rather than have water run through our gills, typically we don't have to worry about algae getting into our lungs. But therein lies the issue. This is clearly airborne now, which brings up a whole host of issues that require immediate respirator adherence like right now. This toxin the algae releases can actually disrupt gill function, which facilitates the exchange of oxygen. By entering human lungs, it may be doing something very similar, and this would result in the coughing that we see later on. Drifting through the air is a completely new function, and it could easily either enter the nose or mouth, go down the trachea and into the bronchial tubes, and this is where toxins would begin agitating the tissue, but there are neuropathic events which we will be seeing momentarily. Randall and Mrs. Turner then head inside as Mrs. Turner randomly goes out on the front porch. Mitch talks to Emily about how the world is seen so different because of all the information we have. Honestly, it seems like with all the information we do have, a lot of people just seem to twist it. This is a very interesting time for our species. So as Mrs. Turner walks around outside because she's feeling it, Mr. Krabs, she goes and then touches some blue material. And as she does, well, it appears that there may be like a self-defense mechanism because a fog builds up and starts choking her. Now, it should be known at this point that this is her infection point. And I think we should go ahead and lay out essentially each individualistic infection vector as it will shed light on why the infection spreads the way it does later. So spoiler alert, Randall was infected when he ate a contaminated oyster, which actually isn't too far from the truth normally. You don't actually need some mystery illness, the regular illness will ruin your week, and if you're immunocompromised, it'll ruin your life. Mrs. Turner becomes infected after she makes direct content with the bioluminescence on the tree, and this would enter her skin and begin her infection process, which we will get more into here in a little bit. And the other two remain uninfected for now, but that is about to change. At this point, Mitch starts asking Randall where Jane went, and like a completely useful and helpful member of society, he says, I don't know, she went out the front door, but then continues to lay there. Like, don't help, bro. You know, that would be really bad for your character arc. So as Emily stands there, she starts feeling it too. Uh, she goes out into the fog, but decides, I'm gonna just shut the door and go back inside. She remarks, however, that she smells something like rotten eggs, which again, one of the things to remember is deep sea hydrothermal vents actually do put out something known as hydrogen sulfide, which has been said to smell like rotten eggs, as well as sulfur in general smelling like rotten eggs. And this would imply that the species currently on the surface hails from deep within the ocean. Randall continues to lay there like a slug, and eventually Emily starts straight up tripping as well, as she tells Randall she doesn't feel too good, and he lays there again, not doing anything, and eventually she just sort of passes out and then wakes up in a dark house. So what kind of information can we glean from this? Again, whatever she was exposed to is going to be airborne as made mention by what we can see and the smell. When she first smelled the rotten eggs, this was her being exposed to the species in the surrounding area by basically the scent that it makes. This effect that it would have on her neurological capacity appears to be one of a depressant of some sort. As light begins to flash, she mentions how she sees sunspots and begins hallucinating lights all around her. Now the thing about hallucinations is, it's actually caused by neurological function decreasing in activity instead of increasing. So what's happening? Well, upon entering her lungs, this mystery toxin produced would quickly diffuse into the circulatory system, but this still takes time to have an impact on the brain. But what is it specifically? Well, this is the interesting part. There is a type of toxin produced by algal blooms that typically we see contamination within the shellfish population. Known as demoic acid, this is a marine biotoxin that induces something known as amnesiac shellfish poisoning. Typically, how humans come into contact with this poisoning is shellfish will filter the algae through, the toxins will build up and then we'll eat it. Typically, we do not come into contact with this toxin because we are not filtering vast quantities of seawater through our bodies during an algal bloom, or I really suppose at all. When this poisoning happens to humans, it disrupts neurological function in Homo sapiens to the point that it can erase memory. The symptoms are of interest to what we will see later because they could be headaches, dizziness, confusion, disorientation, motor weakness, seizures, profuse respiratory secretions, cardiac arrhythmias, coma, and potentially even your death. So remember who ate the oyster? Randall is on borrowed time. Emily, however, was subjected to poisoning via toxins in the air, and as a result, she does not appear to be infected at this point. Mitch, however, was outside and was likely exposed directly to the organism, which resulted in his infection. So we can assume that likely the same thing happened to him as he passed out outside 
then became infected. The toxin entering the brain clearly would have had a neuropathic effect on Emily as she mentions, again, seeing sunspots and the coloring of lights. She tells Randall that she doesn't feel good, which as the dizziness then sets in, this confirms there is a toxin in her body leading her towards unconsciousness. Once the brain functions were disrupted, she would enter a state of unconsciousness as likely the brain would be trying to protect itself or it was just so disrupted that it could not maintain. And then the body would begin filtering toxins out of itself via the kidneys, which would be interesting to see the effects of these toxins on the waste removal system of the body. Emily wakes up and everyone at this point has left the room because it's 2.07 a.m. except for Randall. And as she calls out, yeah, he was laying there all night and won't get up. She hears Mrs. Turner coughing as Mitch then closes the door, sealing them out. So they decide to go to bed, but as Emily looks out, she sees that there still are spores in the air. And this can mean several things. Either the spores are still in the house, or this is another species entirely, which is less detrimental to human functioning. If it was the same species that was outside of the house, this would mean it would be highly unlikely that she would have woken up at all. Then she appears to immediately pass out again, thinking about the ocean before waking back up, and it's no longer even morning, it's afternoon. And everyone else isn't really doing so hot. She attempts to wake Randall up, who's still trying to sleep. Granted, he is infected at this point, but the incubation period hasn't completely progressed to where he would be symptomatic. Emily then heads downstairs to find Mrs. Turner sitting there menacingly with her pills as she will not answer her. She then asks where Mitch is, but Mrs. Turner doesn't answer. Instead, she gets up and begins shakily going up the stairs. We then see more heroics from Randall as she's clearly having difficulty, you know, walking up the stairs and rather than help, he just sort of like slides past her. Bruh. So they go outside and call for Mitch, but there's no answers. The water is looking pretty though, so at least, you know, that's a plus. They give up the search after a few minutes and decided to stay out of the beach for a while. Getting some sun, Randall gets up a while later to go poop himself to death because he ate bad oysters. That's never fun. It is at this point that he has become symptomatic for his infection. It appears point of entry concerning infection is highly important to how it affects your body, which we'll break down here in a moment, but as he wraps that up, it is seen that he left his keys with his shoes. While Emily is out there, Mitch just randomly arrives to talk to her. He asks where everyone is, but this sort of creeps Emily out as nobody's out there, and he's just like really kind of weird. Like He was weirding me out too. But uh, basically Randall is doing the same thing with the water and spots has something in it, so he's definitely not doing good but heading outside of the bathroom he hears a banging noise upstairs and goes up there to finally do something with his life back out of the beach mitch goes on basically it appears he's kind of losing touch with reality somewhat and decides hey i'm gonna go for a swim except it's not really swimming so much as just walking out there and dunking his head under the water all right well off into the sunset i suppose but the question is what is the infection doing and why is it so different depending on who is infected and how it happened well, that's a good question, bro. Let's discuss. So Mitch was not infected tactically like his wife, but instead was infected via the airborne spores outside. These spores appear at this point to have thwarted any attempt by the macrophages patrolling his lungs to clear the infection, as whatever species those spores were have likely entered the body at this point and are really just riding in the circulatory highway and have entered his brain. This would likely mean that this spore is parasitic in nature, given how it influences behavior, which, for an example, we turn towards everyone's favorite parasite, Toxoplasmosis gondii. Toxoplasmosis gondii, or just Toxoplasmosis for short, which really doesn't save that much time, is a species that typically is endemic to birds and felines by using rodents as a midstep. Part of their life cycle involves infecting a rodent and changing its behavioral patterns to make it attracted to the smell of cat urine as if it like wants to mate with the cat urine. So it wanders out in the open as well, and this attracts birds of prey. This is the parasite directly influencing the detrimental behavior of the rodent. Upon being eaten, it will complete its life cycle in the animal's intestines. Eggs in itself are then excreted, which rodents will find, then eat, continuing its life cycle and allowing it to be a parasite. Where the issues arise is when humans get involved. Considering we have feline friends and litter boxes, humans come into contact with the parasite and we can inadvertently become infected. When that happens, there are observable effects on our mental functionality and behaviors as well. We will actually stop being repulsed by the smell of cat urine, which can lead to the crazy cat lady down the street. You wonder to yourself, how can she even stand the smell? Well, it's likely toxoplasmosis infection that makes her love the smell, and then she starts hoarding cats. Remember, there's a fine line between being helpful and harmful when taking care of cats. Now, you might think, ew, gross, who gets infected with these parasites? Well, potentially you, statistically speaking. Now, in the U.S., it's around 11% of the population has likely been infected with this parasite, but in some populations, it can be as high as 60% who have contracted it. Typically, your body will destroy the parasite 
and because you are an imperfect host, Parasite will really not be able to reproduce that well in your body to the point that you become inundated and succumb, so to speak. But it can definitely have impact on behaviors while it is infecting you, and if continually exposed, it's really hard to clear the infection and return to normalcy. We can assume the same thing happening to Mitch. After being infected by the spore, the creature, again, comes from the ocean. And just like how a parasite can cause a rodent to engage in behaviors such as going out in the open uh, to end its life, the spore might be directing Mitch to literally go out into the open in the ocean, which results in him drowning by influence of the parasitic spore because it's looking for its actual host that it wants to infect. Because remember, I'm not sure if this is going to be shocking to you, but these life forms are supposed to be from deep under the ocean. So if you're not, say, hiding and you're just kind of wandering around, if something finds you, boom, you're getting eaten. Like whether you're a fish or a jellyfish or a giant squid, you're getting eaten. And the parasite might be looking for that perfect host to eat who it has infected, much like toxoplasmosis looks for. So as Emily goes out there and calls for him, she steps on something and it immediately goes in her foot. Good lord, what is that thing? Well, I'm glad you asked. This is Emily's infection point, and there is a species that once upon a time was known to do this. Prior to stepping on this thing, she looks out and spots a bunch of strange looking, but clearly jellyfish. Did you know at one point in time, jellyfish had a much more parasitic nature? They were known to be just a few cells long and shaped like worms. They would infect certain vertebrae of fish, and for a long time, we actually thought they were just uh, protists, but it came to light that these were really jellyfish. This species appears to infect in a lot of the same way. After washing up on shore, a worm-like structure would immediately enter her foot and begin her infection. We will go further into the effects of this, but this infection appears to have begun altering the very genetic coding in her body to a degree based on what we will see later and with others who have become infected. Emily at this point starts crawling up the stairs calling out for Randall. Yeah, that's gonna be helpful. Getting inside the house, he is still nowhere to be seen, and as she goes and pours distilled vinegar on her foot, she pulls out a helminth, which is not good. It seems pretty bad. But it's uh, rather interesting, as the infection appears to have gone from simply a single-celled airborne microorganism to forming essentially multicellular worms, or at least this could be another species, which can easily pierce human skin. But what exactly is happening here? We covered that clearly this is a worm, so it appears like a much more prehistoric form of jellyfish back in its parasitic era. No healing era here, but this is still a present issue for Emily. While she removed the bulk of it, remember that these worms could be just as large as a few cells. Removing those would prove much more difficult, and what's worse is, again, it appears to affect the genetic coding, which we'll get there. Heading upstairs, she wraps her foot, and then she spots Randall lying down again, crawling away. As she goes to help him, she spots Mrs. Turner with the whites of her eyes only showing. This would imply that the infection is in her eyes to a degree, as her skin is also showing signs of an immune response and infection. Touching the forbidden blue Nickelodeon slime on the trees has led to her integument system to be inundated with this organism, and by association, her eyes were an easy target, which then has probably rendered her largely blind. From here, it would be easy to follow the optic nerve to the brain, altering behavioral patterns by influencing the midbrain and limbic system, making her more aggressive, and relying purely on instinct driven by the organism. So they go outside as they trap Mrs. Turner inside, and okay, hilariously, Randall can't stand, but now all of a sudden he can walk, but he chose to crawl. How dramatic. So they go to the next house as the neighbor doesn't appear to be there. Randall says he must have been knocked out or something as he tried to help Mrs. Turner, but he can't remember. No, Randall, I just don't think you remember helping her because you didn't try. You probably got hit by the door or something. Then the fog starts moving in as the neighbor comes crawling around the corner to check on them. Running into the fog, they find a flashing light from a truck and start heading there. Leaving Randall at the mailbox, Emily gets in the truck coughing and then calls for help. Again, I can only assume there's some sort of airborne toxin in this fog itself and not just the organism. She gets a response, but it's pretty broken up. Essentially, it says the fog isn't dangerous, but something else is. The voice continues and says the exposed are extremely dangerous. They just seem to crawl through, though, so I really think a brisk walk would save you. Emily then leaves the truck as Randall fell down off the mailbox, saying maybe the beach wasn't such a good idea. Well, bro, I think your whole plan of staying at the beach house in general was a dumb idea, but that's just me. So Emily at this point starts zoning out a bit due to the buildup of toxins that she's currently experiencing before breaking into the house. Her and Reynolds then head inside to get out of the fog before heading further inside to get out of the fog entirely. Going further into the house, she puts down Randall so that he can sleep again, as then she finds trash strewn all over the house and begins looking for keys. Randall has a moment where he realizes the jig is up, the news is out, he's contracted the mystery oyster illness, as Emily then gives him a pep talk about not meeting his maker. Emily then turns on the TV to find emergency broadcasts, as well as just the same thing on the radio. So she says that they need to lock themselves in and seal the windows and just wait it out. Randall at this point is circling the drain as Emily tells him not to be scared. She decides to check the basement to see if there's anything down there that they can use to get out of there. 
Randall keeps listening to the radio as we hear something I thought was pretty hilarious. Now, if you didn't know this stuff, you'd be like, oh my god, this sounds terrible. But, okay, this just started happening, right? Somehow, they've already figured out this isn't a carbon-based life form, which... You know how difficult that would be to figure out in just two days? Maybe three days tops, given how everyone is succumbing? Not to mention, the connection this movie has is drawing, like, life is from, like, the deep, deep sea, like, way down there. If life did evolve from the hydrothermal vents like this movie is suggesting, then everything on land would have evolved from everything that came from the vents. Which means, if we're carbon-based, so are the original inhabitants. Yet somehow they're mystically not carbon-based. Also, apparently it's an extinction-level event. I ask you, what are you basing that on? We wouldn't call an algal bloom in the ocean that kills fish an extinction level event. We would call it an issue, but to suggest that this is going to cover the entire planet when it clearly needs high humidity to survive given the fog that rolls with it and the apparent temperature necessary for its survival, there are likely like large swaths of untouched areas inland that would be absolutely non-conducive for this species survival because it would not be adapted to Earth's climate. Again, it's so dramatic. Truth be told, we wouldn't know any of this. What we would know, or at least I can glean, and this is from like the perspective of, you know, working with diseases and blah blah blah, but this is an infection that results in several things. First, it appears to be largely parasitic and has infected species that were already in the ocean before moving on to land. How did it move on to land and into the air? It would have to be a species that could evolve quite quickly and adapt or possibly already had adaptations by pure happen chance that would allow it to move into the air. Upon infection, it appears to degrade the body in a very specific way, such as inducing blindness and loss of behavioral control, suggesting potential uh, meningitis flaring up. The loss of motor function implies the potential issue of toxins being released by the parasite during infection. And from a more top-down perspective, high humidity areas such as near coasts would be the hardest hit if this species is reliant on air currents. This would actually largely push it back out to sea during the day and then bring it in during the night. This would, however, not completely change the entire planet. It appears that a simple filter could protect a person and something like shoes or clothing may protect the body from exposure. It's clear that this parasite does enter cells, which means it is incredibly small. By some method, it may actually be able to impart its own functional DNA into a host cell, which obviously would be a little strange, as this does potentially, since it's a cell, imply some form of forced conjugation with eukaryotic cells altering the DNA and changing the person. We'll see the effects here momentarily. So as Emily heads to the basement, she finds two people down there. One looking like Pizza the Hut from Spaceballs, and the other just some random dude less infected. Yep, I didn't need to see any of that. This is the infection of the cell itself, as I just mentioned. It's clear that the skin is taking on a new form, brought on by the information implanted by the parasitic cells. This would cause the cells to take on new roles, as they are being directed by something else. It's basically just gene expression. And this could affect its integrity, turning someone into Pizza the Hut. She then grabs the air tanks as Randall begins succumbing to his infection. He throws up a worm, congratulations it's a boy, and then Randall's eyes turn white and that's all she wrote on that. So what is this? Well it's clear that this parasite not only injects its DNA into cells but also exchanges DNA. Again, something like bacteria does this with bacteria all the time and it appears that this ancient form of life is doing the same. It would have picked up oyster DNA from the oyster that Randall ate and then upon him eating it, it would have fused using the tissue in his stomach to create one of these creatures. We can assume that with the human oyster parasite mix that this worm is capable of infecting much like the worm that infected Emily. We also saw a version of this worm way back at the beginning on the boardwalk when Emily was smoking a cigarette. This likely came from the bird that consumed the oyster and befell the same fate as it threw it up. Heading back upstairs, Emily calls out for Randall, but he's done so, so she smacks him in the head with an air tank to put him out of his misery. Though, I think he's not even really in there anymore, so it doesn't matter. She then finds some keys on the floor. Also, again, I have to ask, what really makes the exposed so dangerous so far? They haven't really done much of anything. I mean, don't touch them, but if you operate under the idea of standard precaution, which is to assume everyone has every disease, ever, you'd be okay. Heading into the Chevy Blazer, she exits the area, or at least attempts to. For some reason, she turns off the air when she could have just put it on recirculate. But because she doesn't do this, driving through the fog, her windshield begins to fog up, and she crashes into a tree at four miles per hour, which apparently breaks everything. Alrighty then. I mean, it is a Chevy Blazer, so who knows. Waking up, she crawls outside of the car and into a puddle of water before she starts tripping again. Seeing the ocean and going under the water, I assume she just falls asleep, but eventually she wakes back up and she's at the ocean. For some reason, she's able to maintain her consciousness, no idea how, and as she lays there telling herself don't be scared, a wave washes over her and presumably she joins the ocean. Well, what in the name of all that is holy was that ending? This movie didn't even play by its own rules half the time, and I am so confused. But I think 
I might be able to explain it. So predicated on how a person is infected and by what, it appears as though this is a multi-species event. The idea that water is warming and because of that ancient deep sea creatures are all coming up is basically the premise that they're running with, which is hilarious. But you know what? I'm gonna do it to them. Welcome to Roanoke Shoulder Check's Dumb Ideas section. Here's the first issue. While the tops of the water are warmer, the deep sea is still incredibly cold. As we know, life gathers around hydrothermal vents to remain warm and kind of thrive. While animals can exist in the cold, dark depths, these ancient animals would be doing just fine with these temperatures. To escape warm temperatures, why would they ascend to even warmer waters? Wouldn't that be less conducive? Along with that, the pressure changes would absolutely destroy them. You cannot go from existing at those high of pressures to low pressures such as one atmosphere, much like humans cannot go from existing at one atmosphere of pressure to essentially where the Titan submersible imploded. The processes on the body would not be able to compensate. More to the point, it would be incredibly painful for any organism as well, which would deter them from ascending. In fact, it's really sad when they, oh, it's like, oh, we caught this deep sea fish and pulled it to the surface. That is horrendous, actually. And very bad stuff. So you can kind of see that they're on the surface. So now what? You're telling me a species that was adapted to the deep sea can all of a sudden exist on the surface but not just in the water but also exist in the air exposed to solar radiation which it has never had to contend with before no this species or multi-species event would be absolutely obliterated trying to do this even if it was just a mad dash to escape the seafloor due to rising temperatures it wouldn't make it very far before the amount of environmental change would cause a mass die-off this is why i don't buy the whole thing about it being an extinction level event based on three days of exposure nah the fact is our environment may as well be worlds apart and any species that is down there would absolutely eat dirt up here. So now an argument could be made that what if it's like tardigrade levels of adaptation? If that's the case, I could see them surviving up here, but this is indicated to be a multiple species event all arising at the same time. And because of this, it's not just the microorganisms, but things like jellyfish as well. Are they all composed of tardigrade levels of ability to deal with environmental changes? Somehow I severely doubt that would be possible. But at the end, with Emily, what happened with her? Well, somehow this mystery disease is not only able to thrive in all environments that it was never designed for, but it's also able to interact with cells that it would have never really come across before. And because of this, the jellyfish specifically would have infected Emily, as we have seen. And when it did so, this caused her body to begin exhibiting jellyfish-like structuring. And considering jellyfish actually do evaporate when they end up on the beach, due to the amount of water that they have in their bodies, they, they pretty much just kind of go away. The same was actually happening to Emily before a wave hit her and essentially evaporated her body and scattered her into the sea. How she was operational to tell herself that it was okay and don't be scared at this point, your brain would be so gone there is no possibility this would ever happen. But actually, you know, forget what I said at the beginning of the video. I'm no longer kidding. Nobody gets a birthday this year. But anyhow, I want to thank you guys for watching. If you enjoyed, leaving a like is greatly appreciated as it lets me know that you enjoyed and subscribing lets me know that you're here for this type of content. If you want to be notified of when I post, hitting the bell occasionally lets you know that. I'll drop my Twitter, Discord, Patreon, and Roanoke Tales channel link where last week we talked about the vanishing of the USS Cyclops and the Bermuda Triangle. But also speaking of patrons, I'd like to thank mine real quick. First, as always, huge thank you to my boy Death's Dancer at the Astrophysicist tier. Thanks, man. I'd also like to thank our scientists Chad W., Lacune, Logan Satome, and Tyson Nakanishi. Thank you guys as well. And to the rest of my patrons, I really do appreciate y'all's support. It goes a long way. You don't have to do it, and that's what makes it awesome. So thank you. But that's going to do for me. I hope everyone enjoyed, and I will see y'all in the next one.